On the night of November 23, 2021, the world watched in suspense as the giants of the video game industry clashed during the 39th Golden Joystick Awards for the title of the ultimate game of all time. Among the 1.1 million games released in the last 50 years, 20 titles were shortlisted as candidates for the coveted award. These contenders underwent rigorous evaluation and were assessed based on several key factors, including critical reception, legacy, influence, commercial success, and social impact. This compilation unquestionably comprises the pinnacle of video game excellence. We have iconic titles such as Doom, hailed as the most influential shooter in gaming history, Minecraft, recognized as the highest selling game of all time, and Super Mario 64, celebrated as the most important platformer in history, among others. The award, decided through public votes, witnessed the very best games of all time vying for the crown. This represents the best of the best, competing for the ultimate title. We know that you just want to know who took this home, this big landmark prize, so let's crown the winner for the ultimate game of all time award. At number five, it's... Minecraft. At number four, it's... Half-Life 2. At number three, we have... The Legend of Zelda, Breath of the Wild. And at number two, it's... Doom, 1993. But the winner for the ultimate game of all time is... Dark Souls. With the Golden Joystick Awards being a People's Choice Award entirely voted on by fans, Dark Souls managed to secure an incredibly prestigious prize as the ultimate game of all time. This reordered list, ranked based on the number of votes each game received, illustrates the number of all-time classics Dark Souls had to surpass to earn its crown. In second place, we find arguably one of the most influential first-person shooters of all time in Doom while Link's glorious open-world adventure in Breath of the Wild managed to secure third place. While Dark Souls boasts a strong following, it was surprising to see it emerge victorious, especially considering some of the other titles on this list. Both Minecraft and Grand Theft Auto V, for example, surpass it in sales. Additionally, in terms of awards and critical acclaim, both The Legend of Zelda, Breath of the Wild, and The Last of Us outshine it. Joe Donnelly, features editor at GamesRadar, explained why Dark Souls is the best video game of all time, stating, We'll continue discussing Dark Souls in another 10 years, and yet another 10 years after that. In Dark Souls, we're told that history repeats itself, but in reality, there will probably never be a game quite like it again. To provide further insights into why Dark Souls won the ultimate game of all time, we turn to Kiza McDonald, one of the earliest journalists to cover the Souls games, even before they gained mainstream popularity in the West. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Keza McDonald and I am the video games editor at The Guardian. I was lucky enough to write the first ever review of Dark Souls 10 years ago. I also wrote this book, it's called You Died, it's about Dark Souls. Uh, and I've been tasked with explaining why it is that Dark Souls deserves the accolade of ultimate game of all time. So, the first thing people think about when they think about Dark Souls is that it's a very difficult game, it's very challenging. But if you ask me, that is the least interesting thing that you can say about Dark Souls. That's the most boring facts about it. It is a totally absorbing dark fantasy. Uh, and it's a game that really trusts you as a player. It trusts your curiosity, your intelligence, and your perseverance. Instead of handing you everything on a plate, it lets you find your own way through the game. And that's what makes it so memorable and so absorbing for everybody who's played it, because everybody who's played Dark Souls has overcome what seemed like impossible odds at the beginning. And you get this sense of just becoming better, not just at the game, but like becoming better as a person almost. You're kind of overcoming your own challenges and your own self-belief. I really feel like it's the most rewarding game that I've ever played. Every hour that you spend with it, it gives something back to you in terms of a sense of achievement or a greater sense of understanding of its world. It's also a game that you could play through every year and always find just something different in the experience, whether that's the different way that you play it or something new that you see in the world. And although it is a hard game, there's help available. This is a game that has millions of people there to help you through their accumulated knowledge. Dark Souls is a shared experience. It's a game that you mostly play by yourself, 
even though you can summon in people to help you. But despite that, you become part of this community of people who has been through the gauntlet and felt the same feelings that you've felt and overcome the same challenges that you've overcome. I think the Dark Souls changed game design for the better. There was a point before in the 2000s where games were constantly just trying to age cinema. They were trying to become essentially interactive films. And Dark Souls was part of a movement that really saw games claim their own ways of telling stories and their own ways of engaging us. And instead of trying to ape Hollywood, you know, Dark Souls just is very unapologetically itself. And I think that that was necessary in games at that time. There's a lot of other games that have come since Dark Souls that have taken cues from the way that it engages players, the way it tells its story, and also its combat, which is just, it's just incredible. It's just such a, a wonderful game to play in the hands. Hidetaka Miyazaki responded to the award saying, I am truly grateful to have received such a wonderful award on this occasion. I can hardly believe I was chosen by the users among the many esteemed nominated works. It is a tremendous honor, and I truly appreciate it. This is thanks to everyone who was involved in and supported the development, including From Software and Bandai Namco Entertainment. And above all, thanks to all the users who played and supported the game with their hearts. Thank you very much. At that time, as newcomers, the staff members who started their careers as game creators from the Dark Souls series have now grown and become the core of the latest work, Elden Ring. In that sense, this award holds significant meaning. I intend to continue creating interesting and valuable games in the future. I would be delighted if you could look forward to them. Thank you for your continued support. In his reply, Miyazaki attributed the success of his game partly to the people who made his vision possible, and it is well deserved, considering that Dark Souls was developed during the lowest point in his career, right after the failure of the game known as Demon Souls. This is the story of the creation of Dark Souls, and how it brought forth the creative genius of Hidetaka Miyazaki, crafting a title that would eventually be hailed as the ultimate game of all time. Join me as we explore its creation and unveil the fascinating journey behind Miyazaki's second masterpiece. In February 2009, at the age of 35, Hidetaka Miyazaki witnessed the release of his first dark fantasy game, named Demon's Souls, in the Japanese market. Within a week, both From Software and Sony soon realized that Demon's Souls had underperformed and failed to meet Sony's financial expectations. As a clear sign of a lack of confidence, Sony chose not to publish it outside Japan, believing the game wouldn't be profitable. However, this situation didn't last long, as the Western audience began to discover Demon's Souls. Even though it was released exclusively in Japan, many Western critics, players, streamers, and YouTubers imported the game, and it started to gain a reputation as one of the hardest games on the PS3. Through word of mouth, the popularity of Demon's Souls grew, prompting eager requests for an official Western release. This opportunity was seized by Atlas and Bandai Namco, resulting in an explosion in the sales of the game. With the success of Demon's Souls, you may ask, where is the sequel, and how does Dark Souls come into the picture? The key to understanding this lies in the initial failure of Demon's Souls, which removed any chance of From Software making a sequel within that time frame. Sony had entirely given up on the game and wouldn't even publish it outside Japan. It was only through Atlas and Bandai Namco that Western releases became possible. So, the main question now is, what was Miyazaki doing between the period when Demon's Souls was considered a failure and before it became a success? This is where Dark Souls enters our story. The period we're referring to above spans around eight months, from February 2009 for the Japan release to October 2009 for the Western release. Within those eight months, Miyazaki and his team began working on a game that was similar to Demon's Souls. However, they couldn't call it a sequel since the IP of Demon's Souls belonged to Sony. With Bandai Namco as their new partner, From Software was creating a new Souls game, and this new game is what became known as Dark Souls. Miyazaki explained, Development for Dark Souls began sometime after the release of Demon's Souls. At that point, Demon's Souls hadn't yet gained widespread recognition neither in Japan nor globally. Its recognition came later. The worldwide release of Demon's Souls happened subsequently. Reviews were being created at the end of the year, and it won some awards, but the development of Dark Souls had already started by then. 
Note that when Miyazaki began development for Dark Souls, it was within the context of a director who failed in his first attempt at dark fantasy. So, we can say that this was a bold leap of faith on the part of From Software to allow him to create another game that followed the template of the previous failed game. Punishing difficulty, obscure game mechanics, implicit storytelling, and so on. The primary motivation for Miyazaki in pursuing this, during a period when he thought he had failed in his initial attempt, was to bring to life the new ideas he and his team had learned while making Demon's Souls. Miyazaki expressed, at the beginning, it was more about the developers wanting to create a sequel, and we weren't anticipating significant sales for Demon's Souls. We didn't want to let the game fade away, but we couldn't generate more sales. Later on, we started receiving highly positive feedback, and the atmosphere around us began to shift, but it never reached a go-go-go situation. We didn't expect to gain this level of fame, and game development is costly, but with the positive reviews coming in, we thought, oh, we'll have more funding and time to develop. It was exhilarating. Nevertheless, we remained cautious. In an interview, Miyazaki expressed his gratitude to the fans of Demon's Souls for affording him a second chance in the dark fantasy genre. He stated, I consider the title Demon's Souls to be a game where players helped me. I feel that through the game, players have given me a chance. The interviewer then remarked how the game became a hit primarily through word of mouth. Miyazaki responded, yes, it was. So it might sound like a platitude, but I think we have to repay that kindness, including the feedback we received, by returning it in the form of a game. As I mentioned at the beginning of this interview, fans who view this game as the successor to Demon's Souls have high expectations, and I feel the responsibility not to disappoint them, no matter what. Miyazaki assumed both the roles of director and producer for the game Dark Souls. He didn't particularly enjoy the experience because his producer responsibilities sometimes interfered with his directorial role. He explained, I hold the titles of director and producer. During Demon's Souls, I was solely the director, but I did handle some producer-like tasks within the company. So, the nature of the work didn't change much. However, I fundamentally see myself as a director. The reason I took on the role of producer was simply that it was the quickest way to maintain focus on creating an engaging game and propel the project forward with that core concept. It was very challenging, to be honest. To claim otherwise would be dishonest. The expectations for Dark Souls surpassed our initial estimates both domestically and internationally. While we were pleased with this, in the later stages of development, the workload as a producer became quite substantial, and I couldn't adequately fulfill my duties as a director. While some of it stemmed from my own limitations, I ended up becoming a bottleneck in the development process and caused a great deal of trouble for the staff. To be completely honest, I don't believe I will take on both roles again for a project of this scale. In numerous interviews explaining the origin of Dark Souls, Miyazaki emphasizes that it is not a sequel. This clarification is necessary since the new game is an intellectual property of Bandai Namco, and any ambiguity could potentially lead to legal issues with Sony. Miyazaki stated, Dark Souls isn't a sequel to our previous game, Demon's Souls, by any means. However, it was developed by the same producers and director, and so certain ideologies, ideas, and themes have carried over and are similar. It's an entirely new game with similar concepts. In another interview, when asked about the possibility of a sequel, Miyazaki shared, If I were to say that I didn't want to make Demon's Souls 2 initially, that would be a lie. However, various circumstances led to it not happening. That being said, looking back now, I think it might have been a good thing that it became Dark Souls instead. Because it wasn't a direct sequel, we didn't have strange constraints, and we were able to adopt new ideas. From a creative perspective, it might have been a good thing in the end. Regarding the worlds of Demon Souls and Dark Souls, Miyazaki emphasized that the two games do not exist in the same universe. Their worlds and stories are unrelated. Miyazaki clarified, There are no connections to past from software titles, including Demon's Souls. If there were any, they would be more like playful elements, similar to Moonlight. At the start of product development, Miyazaki wanted the game to be titled Dark Race. He preferred not to use the word Souls in the title, as it might remind people of Demon's Souls, and complicate the explanation of whether the new game was a sequel or not. Therefore, the title Dark Race seemed to address potential legal issues and differentiate the game from its predecessor. However, 
Miyazaki soon discovered that he couldn't use Dark Race due to its racist implications. While searching for a better title, they began using the codename Project Dark. Miyazaki explained, Originally, before the Tokyo Game Show in 2010, we planned to use the title Dark Race. In this game, players are cursed beings, hence the name Dark Race. However, there were concerns about its potential to be considered discriminatory in overseas markets, which made sense to us. However, we had only two days left until the game show. So, during the game show, we had to quickly change it to Project Dark. The decision was made while looking at the Dark Race logo, thinking, well, race doesn't work, so let's just go with Dark. Miyazaki continued his search for a fitting title for the new game, and came up with two candidates, Dark Lord and Dark Ring. He couldn't proceed with Dark Lord, as someone else already owned the trademark. Regarding Dark Ring, it had an even worse connotation than Dark Race. Miyazaki added, Afterward, it was decided that the title would contain Dark. We considered Dark Lord and Dark Ring as potential titles. We couldn't secure the trademark for the former, but the latter was available. So, we settled on Dark Ring. Then, around the beginning of the new year, we were told that Dark Ring means anus. And I thought, that's ridiculous. In the end, without making a big fuss, we settled on Dark Souls. In an interview, the host asked Miyazaki how he came up with the story of Dark Souls. Miyazaki explained, Basically, we worked on the story afterward. We started with the layout of the game itself with minimal story around it. It's story for the game before game for the story for me. So as long as it meets the game's requirements to create immersion for the player, it's all good. I wanted the player to experience the story, so we did not focus on creating a linear storyline. I don't want to spoon-feed the story. I prefer players to unravel it using their imagination and our hints. Then the host asked if the lack of story was planned after all. Miyazaki replied, Yes, I didn't want to make a game that revolves solely around the story, so we refrained from providing too much information, and the hints were intentionally made vague to allow the player to become one with the story. We only offered information in certain areas to stimulate the player's imagination. So, for those who want to uncover the story, there are plenty of hints. The question is, where to find them? A lot of information is scattered throughout item descriptions. If players want to delve deeper into the narrative, I encourage them to read these descriptions. I went with the idea of not imposing the story on players and refrained from intruding into their experiences, allowing their imagination to shape the world. Learning from mistakes is a principle that Miyazaki faithfully follows. In his Tokyo office, he had a screen set up during Dark Souls' development that constantly scrolled through emails and feedback that fans had sent in, both positive and negative. He explained, I'm not sure about other producers, but I read both the good news and the bad. In Demon's Souls, we tried to implement some features in a kind of experimental way, not being sure whether or not they would be popular, but we did it anyway, so that we could see how people reacted. The way we implemented new features is not a direct result of fan requests. We didn't do exactly what people asked for. Instead, I digested and analyzed what people were saying, and determined from all of that what they needed and how we could approach it in a way entirely different from other games, a way they were not expecting. In an interview, the host commented on the size of the teams working on From Software projects. Miyazaki shared, That tends to surprise people a lot. When foreign media visit our office for interviews and we show them the design department, they're like, hey, don't mess around. There are only about five or six people here. That's right, especially for the design team. It's quite a small number, so it often surprises people. Of course, being a small team has its challenges and difficulties, but precisely because it's a small team, we can work closely together. That closeness can contribute to the value of the game. In our team, the 3D artists would sometimes be called upon to do work more akin to that of a traditional artist, because we tried to utilize their skills as much as possible. As I said before, we don't have many artists to work with, and just throwing more people at something doesn't guarantee a better result. We're often compared to the development methods of big foreign titles. I understand the merits of their approach as well. Still, we can't simply copy them, and even if we wanted to, we couldn't do it exactly. Ideally, We'd like to retain our strengths while incorporating the best aspects of their methods. However, the scale of big foreign titles is truly impressive. Unlike Demon Souls, Dark Souls has a well-documented prototype. Miyazaki and the team initially developed a prototype before creating the entire game. Subsequently, 
they reused as much of it as possible, even incorporating the entire prototype world into a section of the main game. If you want to get an idea of what the Dark Souls prototype looked like, simply explore the painted world of Ariamis. Miyazaki explained, We generated a substantial amount of concept art for the painted world, which was originally based on the map we used for the Dark Souls prototype. We invested significant effort into this prototype because it allowed us to authentically convey our vision for the game. I was determined not to let it go to waste and planned to incorporate it into the actual game. However, I couldn't find a seamless way to fit it in, so ultimately, I resorted to placing it within the painted world. It might sound like a makeshift solution, but I actually had a vision for the painted world from the beginning. I'm delighted that I was able to merge that vision with the prototype map. And if you're curious to encounter and battle the original boss from the Dark Souls prototype, pay a visit to Nito's domain. Miyazaki shared, Nito was initially conceived and developed as the boss for the prototype map, so we gave him a wide array of attacks and effects. We engaged in ongoing discussions about his color and overall appearance. Most people aren't aware, but Dark Souls does have a tutorial. However, it's quite different from what you'd typically expect in other games. Instead of gently guiding you through the mechanics, it throws you directly into battles with the monsters you'll encounter in the game. This unconventional approach often leads to many players struggling to progress beyond the game's initial stages, as it effectively serves as a filter to test one's fortitude. Miyazaki instructed the team to ensure that the tutorial represented the actual game experience, hence its level of difficulty. Miyazaki explained, It might sound strange, but it's actually quite common for the tutorial to be the last element integrated into a game, it's much easier to create it once you know what needs to be conveyed and the best way to explain it to the player. I recall suggesting that the Undead Asylum should capture the dark fantasy aesthetic of Dark Souls and distill it to its purest essence. We began with the scene of a gloomy basement cell and stone architecture, incorporating that cold, melancholic atmosphere I mentioned earlier. Once we headed in this direction, the area came together quite swiftly. In many ways, it perfectly aligned with the designs we had been developing up to that point. We included the tutorial, so players wouldn't have to struggle to learn how to play. Our goal was not to guide players step by step, but to help them overcome the initial hurdle. The Souls games are renowned for their challenging difficulty. In the following topics, I've focused on delving deeper into insights from Hidetaka Miyazaki. Miyazaki believes that it's entirely possible to create meaningful games and provide players with a sense of accomplishment without resorting to excessive challenge or difficulty. However, he has deliberately chosen the path of challenge and difficulty to instill that sense of achievement in his players. He elaborated saying, Personally, I don't believe games must always be difficult, so I think there's room for games that offer a more relaxed experience. In the case of Demon Souls and Dark Souls, our aim was to establish a challenging but conquerable difficulty. For Demon's Souls and Dark Souls, we intentionally incorporated a high level of difficulty to achieve that sense of accomplishment. However, if the game's purpose differs, I believe extreme difficulty may not be necessary. I hope that when people actually give it a try, those who aren't deterred by the dark fantasy setting will find enjoyment without delving too deeply into it. To put it bluntly, even a game like Super Mario can present considerable challenges. I personally struggle to get past level 4, but just playing from 1-1 is a lot of fun. I believe it's perfectly acceptable to approach games in that manner as well. If you're an anime fan, particularly of One Piece, you might have noticed that the most satisfying boss fights often involve incredibly dire situations. For instance, when Enel threatened to destroy the entire island of Skypea, or when Doflamingo unleashed his birdcage attack on the entirety of Dressrosa. Miyazaki shares a similar perspective when designing the difficulty of his games. He explained, Ideally, I wanted players to experience a sense of despair initially, and then a glimmer of hope when facing bosses. Enemies that don't evoke despair in players lack the power to truly terrify and can't provide that profound feeling of accomplishment upon defeating them. Without that small glimmer of hope, players might give up or find it hard to persevere when confronted with these challenges. In an interview, the host asked Miyazaki how he prevents the game from becoming excessively punishing, to the point where players might quit in frustration. Miyazaki responded saying, We can't reveal all our secrets, but there are a few ways we keep players engaged. Firstly, the game's difficulty doesn't hinge on a player's skill level. 
We haven't designed a game where those with faster reactions or quicker button presses are inherently better than others. Secondly, when a player dies, we aim to instill a sense of, maybe if I try a different approach, I can succeed. The losses incurred in death can be outweighed by the gains made through subsequent attempts. We strive to provide players with the freedom to shape their own playstyle, and we've incorporated enough content to allow users to keep challenging themselves and progressing. Another crucial aspect is avoiding repetitive difficulty. We don't want players to constantly whittle down an enemy's health bar. All characters, including enemies and the player character, are designed with high attack power but low defense. Our aim isn't for players to mindlessly hack away at foes, it's about strategy. We want players to think, if I avoid this enemy, maybe I can find a way to overcome it. We don't want players to feel frustrated by repeating the same actions over and over. Miyazaki also mentioned that incorporating humor into the challenge can actually encourage players to persevere. He said, it's intertwined with the difficulty. The development team considered it amusing to create a section where players are compelled to navigate on a precarious narrow beam with traps all around. It's tough, but never insurmountable. And there's that comedic element. People might chuckle when they meet their demise, feeling caught off guard by the game. The game's design is aimed at ensuring players don't experience frustration, but instead cultivate understanding and a desire to give it another shot. In an interview, Miyazaki discussed the challenge of playtesting difficulty, highlighting its paradoxical nature. As testers spend more time playing the game, they tend to become increasingly immune to its difficulty, inadvertently making the game seem easier. This paradox contradicts the original goal of playtesting, which is to accurately gauge the game's level of challenge. This issue became apparent when numerous players expressed dissatisfaction with the original curse mechanic, leading the team to release a patch. Miyazaki explained, We may have gone a bit too far with the curse mechanic. We initially believed that once a player's health dropped to a quarter, they wouldn't be cursed further and could cure themselves. We anticipated that very few players would find themselves at one-eighth or one-sixteenth of their health, but it turned out that many players encountered this situation. During game balance testing, we had all our testers play the game, but after a certain amount of playtime, testers tend to become immune to the game's difficulties. We never anticipated that this would occur. Whenever a new Souls game is released, the topic of accessibility often arises, with some players requesting an easy mode similar to what's offered in many mainstream games, allowing players to adjust the game's difficulty. Miyazaki has shared his perspective on this matter, stating, certainly, Discussions regarding accessibility do come up. However, you know, if we were to make the game easier, and as a result, people began to say, they only made it easier to boost sales, I personally couldn't bear that. Both myself and the development team are steadfast in our commitment to not compromise in this regard. Ideally, as we discussed earlier, our goal is to strike a balance where the game remains challenging yet enjoyable. We acknowledge it may seem somewhat contradictory, but if we had to choose between the two, there's no doubt we would prioritize maintaining the difficulty. We genuinely want players to embrace the challenge with their pride on the line. Truly, without that, there would be no sense of achievement. We're fortunate that among all the Souls games, Dark Souls is the most extensively documented in terms of game and art design. In these topics, we'll delve deeper into Miyazaki and his team's design principles. Let's begin with this almost philosophical perspective from Miyazaki regarding what he perceives as the value of video games. He expressed, This might be slightly off topic, but I firmly believe that games are vessels that infuse actions with meaning. I think the inherent enjoyment of games, their distinct form of entertainment, resides precisely in this concept. You could even substitute meaning with value. Actions devoid of meaning or value can feel harsh and empty, don't you think? Games cannot afford to be that way they must clearly impart meaning and value to the players. Well, at least for now, this leans more towards an idealistic viewpoint. To better understand Miyazaki's perspective, one can look at the core essence of a Souls game. By presenting challenges through difficulty, players achieve a profound sense of accomplishment. Consequently, they attribute value to their struggle and frustration as they progress through the game. Miyazaki emphasizes the importance of striking a balance in the amount of information a game provides to players. He explained, In my personal view, the quantity of information in game design holds immense significance. This applies to hints, map design, 
and even storytelling. There exists a delicate equilibrium. Excessive or insufficient information is detrimental. Discovering that ideal midpoint is crucial, but it's also an arduous task, and we undergo a process of trial and error every time. We are fortunate to gain insights into Miyazaki's general approach to game direction, as he shared significant details in one of his interviews. He said, According to the team, my direction was sometimes quite abstract. Well, it was, but I believe that if your instructions become too specific, the resulting designs may lack creativity. So I try to provide only the most fundamental and essential information before leaving it to the artist's imaginations, which often surpass my own. My initial instructions are intentionally abstract. For instance, when designing equipment, I might simply say, make something you can trust with your life on the battlefield, or make something that has enchantments to protect you. I think the artist probably didn't fully grasp my vision half the time. Of course, if I don't get what I want, I gradually offer more specific descriptions, and I might even resort to sketching on a whiteboard. However, I never go as far as to dictate exact colors or shapes. I don't want the designers to become mere tools. It doesn't always go precisely as I envision, but I believe that's often because I haven't fully tapped into the artist's potential, and it's something I aspire to improve upon in the future. With this game, some extraordinary concepts emerged during the initial concept phase, like Lautrec's Armor of Favor. If we had solely focused on rigid requirements rather than embracing experimentation, I don't think something as unique as this would have been born. To encourage such creativity in my designers, I engaged in extensive discussions on various subjects, including philosophy. I discussed concepts and ideas with them, delving into topics like the world, life, death, and concerning the game world, the significance of fire, and the role of the Four Kings. Conversations like these not only assisted the designers in developing their ideas, but also helped me refine my vision of the world I aim to create. I also made a conscious effort not to become predictable or conservative. Granted, we had chosen a fantasy setting, so we couldn't stray too far from that theme, but we had to be cautious not to take the easy route, as it could have made the world dull. I genuinely strive to maintain this balance. Miyazaki shared that the team employed two primary approaches in creating the designs for the game. He elaborated, saying, When we were developing Dark Souls, we pursued two main avenues in the design process. During the initial concept stages, I provided each of the artists with a few simple image words as starting points, and then they had the creative freedom to develop these concepts in any way they saw fit. We would then select the images we found appealing, make any necessary adjustments, and use them as the foundation for shaping the game world. For instance, iconic creatures like the Gaping Dragon, Egg Carrier, and Gnido all emerged during this stage and made it into the final game with minimal alterations. In cases where I had a clearer vision of what I wanted, the design process followed a slightly different path. I would specify things like how a particular element would be used in the game world, or what its intended function was, or if an area had a specific design, I would outline the conditions it needed to meet. Examples of this approach can be seen in the design of creatures like the Mimic and the Gargoyles. Regardless of which design process we employed, rather than assigning a single person to oversee each concept, I would engage in discussions with each of the artists, refining and developing the designs collaboratively. In a future video, we will delve into a game design principle that Miyazaki adheres to, known as total direction. Here is a preview of how it works, particularly in the context of art design. The interviewer asked, given the freedom in the design process and the varying styles of the concept artists, was there a necessity to establish a sense of unity among all the designs? Miyazaki responded, I suppose there was a need for some level of cohesion. However, as I mentioned previously, I took on the responsibility of overseeing all the designs and providing comprehensive direction. Since all the designs passed through me, a degree of unity naturally emerged. Nevertheless, my goal was to accentuate the individual styles of each artist. I firmly believe that fostering close collaboration with each designer to nurture their ideas while embracing their unique artistic styles results in a more enriched and organic game world. As I mentioned earlier, each artist began their creative process with a few simple image words as inspiration for their designs. The words that ignited their creativity and the interpretations they chose to pursue varied greatly. 
Some artists drew inspiration from relatively philosophical terms, while others used them to craft intricate character backstories. Each collaboration had its distinct character, and this diversity injected a stimulating element into the creative process. I consider this diversity to be the primary reason behind the exceptional world of Dark Souls. Unlike many art teams, we did not assign specific areas to individual artists. Instead, all the artists contributed to all aspects, fostering a collaborative and dynamic approach. Miyazaki elaborated further on the culture of collaboration within his team. He stated, My preferred approach is that once the concept design is complete, I always convene all the team members responsible for a particular character. This includes discussions encompassing all of our ideas and collectively determining the direction we want to pursue. It entails involving the artist, animator, effect and sound designer, AI planner and programmer, as well as all the concept artists for each character. This process provides an opportunity to hear everyone's thoughts and align our thinking. I actively encourage every team member to share their ideas, regardless of how seemingly insignificant they may seem because some truly great ideas can emerge from these contributions. For example, the concept of characters being imprisoned within a crystal golem was suggested by our lead artist. Even though we may end up incorporating less than 10% of these ideas into the final product, I still believe this exercise is invaluable. Of course, we could opt for a more directive approach, but I prefer the collaborative process of generating and developing ideas together with everyone contributing to the concept's evolution. In our video on the making of Demon Souls, we highlighted that Miyazaki doesn't design games with a specific focus on the Western audience. He attributes the success of his game to adhering to universal attributes cherished by core gamers. Miyazaki reaffirmed this stance for Dark Souls, stating, We don't primarily think about how the game will be received overseas. We only consider international elements in three specific areas. First, we aim to align the interface and controls with global standards, as long as it doesn't compromise our intended gameplay. Second, we take practical steps to facilitate the localization process. And third, we steer clear of cultural taboos. Essentially, we're not crafting something exclusively for the Western market. As a game creator, I've encountered both triumphs and setbacks, but I firmly believe that our approach of creating a game that can engage gamers from all around the world regardless of nationality, was the right one, and it was fully embraced by our development team. When questioned about his chances of succeeding when competing against large-scale foreign titles, Miyazaki responded, I don't approach it as a matter of winning or losing. However, if you inquire where we aim to excel, it's undoubtedly in the domain of a game's enjoyment. Whether we can attain that goal or not is a separate matter but the aspiration to compete in terms of delivering an enjoyable experience is definitely present. Miyazaki further elaborated on the importance of thinking outside the box and exercising caution when imitating games to maximize player enjoyment. He stated, I've been careful not to follow trends blindly just because everyone else is doing it. It's not that commonly used concepts are inherently bad or should be avoided. If, after careful consideration, you understand the fundamental meaning and purpose behind them, then it's acceptable to incorporate them. In fact, widely adopted features often have sound reasons for their prevalence, so they naturally end up resembling each other. In today's gaming landscape, there's an abundance of game templates. There are well-established design standards, almost like grammar rules for each genre, and numerous variations of these standards. To put it plainly, if you wish to mimic something, you won't run out of material to imitate. However, in the past, there might not have been as many templates to emulate, and developers had to craft games from the ground up, meticulously considering each aspect. I believe one of the reasons why so-called old games were enjoyable is because they were created in this manner. Therefore, when you aim to create an enjoyable game, you shouldn't merely imitate, and even if you do, you should deeply ponder why this particular design choice we frequently engage in discussions along these lines. It's about delving as deeply as possible into the rationale behind design choices and ideally re-evaluating them from scratch. By following this approach, even if you end up imitating, it comes with various insights and discoveries. In practice, both Demon's Souls and Dark Souls adhere to classic action RPG elements in terms of game design. However, it's not as straightforward as blindly following the design and grammar of old games. We deconstructed classic games in our own unique way and made an effort to comprehend them deeply. 
Among all the Souls games, Dark Souls is renowned for its exceptional map design, considered a pinnacle achievement in the genre. Interestingly, it was Miyazaki's first attempt at creating a seamless map, and it became a standout feature in the world of video games. Miyazaki explained, This is actually how most of the areas were constructed. The map design played a pivotal role in dictating every other aspect of the game. Once we determined the essential elements for each area, we immediately sketched out a rough map. After establishing the basic layout of the area, we delved into the finer details. The rough map served as a means to convey the area's requirements, structure, and appearance to the artists, who then collaborated to develop these concepts. I'm never content with designs that merely adhere to the initial brief, so I often encourage the artists and designers to incorporate their own ideas. I believe that these contributions can enhance not only the specific area, but also the entire game, even though it might entail additional work. Miyazaki offered valuable advice on designing large and complex areas, using Blighttown as an example. He explained, When it came to Blighttown, I began with a set of images and concepts I wanted to include. However, given the area's intricate nature, attempting to design it all at once would have been challenging. Instead, we started with prominent features, such as the water wheel elevator, and worked collaboratively with the designers and artists to progressively construct the area from there. This approach allowed for the gradual development of complex areas like Blighttown, ensuring that the final result was cohesive and well executed. Ever wondered why the Souls games feature numerous optional areas? In addition to adhering to the principle of hidden beauty, Miyazaki intentionally makes certain areas optional because he recognizes that they may not be well received by players. For instance, using the depths as an example, he explained, even during playtesting, there were many players who didn't like the depths. So, we created a way for players to complete the game without having to explore or clear the depths. This approach allows players to have a more tailored experience based on their preferences while maintaining the game's overall depth and complexity. The Souls games are renowned for their memorable monster enemies and bosses. Miyazaki adheres to a particular standard when designing them, emphasizing a sense of refinement and elegance. He explained, You might find it hard to believe, but I always aimed for a certain level of sophistication and elegance in all designs. I frequently told the artists that a messy or chaotic design was not desirable. I believe this principle permeates the entire game. If you were to ask me to define this elegance, well, I think you just have to look at the designs and judge for yourself, but it's undeniably one of the most crucial elements in everything I oversee. In most cases, I engage in direct communication with each designer. Regarding the design work, I emphasized the importance of refined work and instructed all the designers not to create anything indecent with excessive blood or gore. To clarify, I consider anything grotesque or excessively bloody to be indecent, so I encourage them to avoid such elements. Consequently, even in the case of Blighttown, which is arguably the rawest and most repulsive area in the game, I wanted it to convey both a profound sense of sadness and a bitter coldness when considering the area as a whole. This is the atmosphere I aimed to establish. You could say it's a characteristic of my working style, and I believe it's evident in Dark Souls' art direction. Throughout our various videos, we've hinted at the concept of hidden beauty when discussing the references and inspirations that Miyazaki incorporates into his games. These influences range from works like Berserk to his favorite books, movies, and anime. In an interview, he provided two examples to illustrate how this principle operates in his game design. The first instance arises when the host comments on the large eyes of the basilisks in the game. Miyazaki explains, Those are actually fake eyes, by the way. If you examine the design works closely, you'll find the small and real eyes right below them. I pay meticulous attention to details that I don't expect many players to easily discover. This statement is crucial to keep in mind when considering areas like the Ash Lake or the Painted World. Miyazaki seemingly crafted them without the explicit intention of players uncovering their secrets. Here's another example. Miyazaki describes a boss enemy named Ceaseless Discharge, saying, All demons are born from the fire of chaos, but he was the first, born long ago when the fire was still unstable. He possesses the fire, but he can't control it, and it constantly burns him. Despite his imposing size, he's actually the youngest of Izalith's children. He stands, gazing up at the ruins where his sisters reside. The only source of comfort in his pitiful, painful existence is the belief that they are watching over him. The interviewer then asks, 
Do you think players could have deduced all of this simply by examining the boss room? To which he replied, I don't think so. There are a huge number of things that, while present in the game, we make no attempt to explain to the player, and many more that they simply have no way of finding out. The Ceaseless Discharges story is just one of these. I recall the main difficulty in designing the character was trying to convey that sense of sadness. People just couldn't see past the fact that he's a flaming giant. Simply giving him a melancholic expression, or making him weep, would have been taking it too far in the opposite direction. It was a very difficult balance to achieve. Dark Souls significantly improved upon the foundation established by Demon's Souls, introducing a range of notable enhancements and changes to the gaming experience. In the following sections, we will delve into these features. Among all the activities of a game designer, map design holds a special place in Miyazaki's heart. He harbored an aspiration to craft a gaming experience featuring a continuous map with minimal loading screens. While he couldn't realize this dream in Demon's Souls, he triumphed with Dark Souls. Miyazaki explained, During the later development stages of Demon's Souls, I began thinking about creating a vast, connected map for a future game, so it wasn't planned for Demon's Souls. As we started development on Dark Souls, I laid out a plan to implement this vast, seamless map. Because the entire world in Dark Souls is interconnected, it had to feel natural as players walked from one area of the map to the next. However, we didn't want players to become bored with everything looking the same, so our design process focused on introducing variation within a reasonable scope and making changes in the map feel natural. As a consequence of creating a mysterious, seamless world, Miyazaki aimed to encourage players to explore it and discover all its secrets. He considers this one of the key differentiators of Dark Souls from the previous game. Miyazaki explained, I designed the world of Dark Souls to be completely interconnected, because I wanted players to enjoy the thrill of discovering the vast game world. If you see a place that seems reachable, please try to get there. Almost all of them are accessible. I view exploration as walking through meaningful spaces with a purpose. Constant confusion and getting lost aren't enjoyable. However, occasionally introducing challenges that can confuse players is a possibility. I also strategically place elements in the maps that help players remember locations. By showing them the destination first and making players want to reach it, I encourage exploration. The first six Souls games are renowned for their lack of in-game maps, and Miyazaki has expressed his perspective on this design choice. He explained, I create map structures that are easy to grasp by considering the order of the player's viewpoint changes and general patterns of behavior. I'm conscious of how players construct a mental map in their heads and make sure not to exceed their processing capacity. For example, if there were suddenly three entrances placed right next to each other, I think it would be hard to remember. Instead, it's more effective to first find one entrance, and when you explore it, realize that this place is probably dangerous. But when you go back, you find another entrance, and then you understand that you can go from here. That kind of sequence is easier to remember. Unlike in other games where players are often guided along a predetermined path, the Souls games encourage unencumbered movement and getting lost is a significant part of the gameplay experience. Miyazaki shared his perspective, stating, In Dark Souls, I want players to experience moments of trouble where they fall and end up in completely different places, wondering what to do next. I've designed it so that you can generally go to places that seem accessible, so enjoy exploring. There might be concerns that it could become confusing due to the focus on exploration, but I've structured it in a way that, essentially, you won't get lost more than you would in Demon's Souls. I've been careful to create a system where you learn as you walk. However, when you expand the space for exploration, there are unknown places waiting there. Out of all the Souls games, Dark Souls is renowned for its exceptional map design, particularly its emphasis on verticality. While other games, including Elden Ring, offer expansive open worlds, they pale in comparison to Dark Souls in this regard. Miyazaki offered insight into this design choice, stating, The maps are designed to be stacked vertically. Surprisingly, I noticed this tendency even during my work on Demon Souls, where I found myself stacking maps vertically instead of naturally expanding them horizontally. So I decided to embrace this characteristic and ensure that players would have the sensation of descending as well as ascending within the game. Given that the maps are seamless in Dark Souls, there are numerous points where players might think, if I jump from here, I'll land in another area, won't I? 
Dark Souls stands out from other games in the Souls series due to its absence of fast travel or teleportation until players reach the midpoint of the game. This unique feature significantly influences the behavior and psychology of players, particularly those new to the genre. In Dark Souls, you might discover yourself trapped in perilous locations without a means of escape or the ability to return to prior areas, especially if you fail to survive the journey back. As a result, the game imparts genuine consequences to the player's actions, making it the most authentic and least game-like experience among the Souls games. Dark Souls truly captures the essence of an authentic adventure, setting it apart from other games in the Souls series. It lacks a heroine to drive quests, provides no refuge in a central hub when things go wrong, offers no teleportation to escape danger, and requires players to confront all perils without guidance or hints on what to do. Moreover, it doesn't force players into a scripted adventure through a narrative. Miyazaki explained his vision, stating, I aim to create a game where the player's gameplay itself would ideally become a story in itself. For instance, if a player gets cursed by a basilisk, their petrification and curse are genuine calamities that have befallen the player, rather than mere plot points. In Demon Souls, when a character dies, they are sent back to the beginning of the dungeon they are in. However, in Dark Souls, Miyazaki introduced the concept of the bonfire to enhance the player's experience in completing a stage. Miyazaki explained, In Dark Souls, we have included the ability for players to choose their recovery points, essentially a respawn point. If your character dies, you won't be taken back to the beginning of the level. As you explore the world, you can carve out your own territory and attempt quests you may have failed. This is a significant difference, and we want players to use this mechanic to plan their approach to the game. The bonfire serves multiple purposes. Firstly, it acts as a recovery point, allowing players to replenish their health when it's low. Secondly, it serves as a respawn point. It's a powerful gameplay mechanic. Thirdly, the bonfire is a place for players to share experiences with others. It's a location where players can gather and communicate, not through words, but through emotions. Lastly, it's perhaps the only place in Dark Souls where players can momentarily relax. In this bleak and dark world, the bonfire provides warmth. It's one of the few places in the game that radiates a sense of comfort, reflecting the dark fantasy world I'm striving to create. PvP was already present in Demon's Souls, but it lacked the role-playing aspect. In Dark Souls, Miyazaki introduced covenants to allow players to engage in role-playing during PvP. Miyazaki explained, The covenant system in Dark Souls is quite unique. I wanted players to enjoy role-playing mechanics, so I created various covenants for players to join. Depending on the covenant a player selects, it affects the enemies in the game, adding a significant role-playing dimension. It's about enabling interactions between players as an extension of their role-playing experiences. They can engage in localized combat or cooperation within the context of their respective roles. For a more relatable example, think of the Lord of the Rings. Imagine one player taking on the role of Frodo, who has discovered the ring, and another player playing the role of a ringwraith desperately searching for it. This would lead to confrontations over the ring. One player might be fully immersed in the role of the ringwraith, while the other accidentally stumbles upon the ring creating a situation like that. Players who began their journey with newer Souls games like Sekiro and Elden Ring were surprised when they encountered the primary health recovery method in Demon's Souls. In contrast to the convenient self-refilling nature of the Estus Flask, players had to collect healing items, known as Moongrass. Not only does the Estus Flask automatically replenish, but it's also upgradable at bonfires. Removing the need for resource management when it comes to healing items allows players to focus more on the adventure, exploration, and combat aspects of the game. This change was welcomed by almost everyone in the Souls community. Dual-wielding weapons were first introduced in Dark Souls, and for Miyazaki, it represents a sign of mastery in combat. Miyazaki explained, Dual-wielding is an option, but it's a very difficult choice for novice players. The default fighting style involves holding a shield in one hand and a weapon in the other, providing a lot of protection and being quite effective. When you see another player dual wielding, we want you to think, oh my god, this guy is special. Dual wielding is a way to challenge yourself, but it has many downsides and makes the game much harder. When you're in trouble, you'll want to return to your shield and sword. We want to keep dual wielding special. 
It's a very unique strategy that will hopefully provide a new experience for the player, as well as those watching them. The curse mechanic was introduced in Dark Souls, and while it's often disliked by some players, it happens to be one of Miyazaki's favorite additions to the game. Miyazaki explained, I wanted players to experience the whole curse thing, both getting cursed and lifting the curse. In many RPGs, getting and lifting curses is a cliché event where the player just says, Oh, I'm cursed. Well, okay then. And it's rather uneventful. That felt boring to me. So here, we made curses a real disaster in the player's journey, including the process of lifting the curse, which can be quite challenging. Maybe we went a little bit over the top with it. Miyazaki has expressed his approval of using various tactics, including what some might consider cheap strategies, to overcome challenges in the game. He was responsible for placing the Black Knight archers on the cathedral ledge in Anor Londo, and he did so intentionally to create memorable obstacles for players. He explained, I think I was the one who placed that obstacle. I wanted to place some obstacles that people would remember and talk about. The archers can be poisoned, so if you hit them with a poison arrow and wait a while, they will die if it isn't treated. Including these kinds of cheap strategies, I want people to have fun with strategizing. There's one approach to combat that involves a head-to-head -head collision, but luring enemies and using cheap strategies is one of the joys of this game as well. Many Elden Ring players have expressed their surprise at the size of the game's world and the abundance of secret locations, continually astonishing both old and new fans alike. However, this is not the first time the Souls games accomplished this feat. Dark Souls did it first, and did it best. During an interview about Dark Souls, the host asked, We kept feeling like our descent had hit rock bottom, and then another stratum would open up. Did it become a development goal to see how many times you could surprise the player in this manner? Miyazaki replied, A lot of information has already come to light about the game's world, but we wanted players to feel like there was no end to the hole, or how far down you could go. The idea was to have a stage named something like the bottom of the world, but then players would discover that there's an even lower level, and then another level beneath that, and even after defeating that boss, there's yet another level below. We aimed to give players the surprise of never knowing where the world's boundaries lie. Earlier, we discussed the origin of the Dark Souls title, and how Miyazaki transitioned from one name to another. During the Tokyo Game Show, when the final title had not yet been determined, Miyazaki employed the codename Project Dark. I'd like to present this trailer for Project Dark, which was originally showcased at the Tokyo Game Show in 2010, as many Dark Souls fans may not have had the opportunity to view it. During the development of Demon's Souls, a demo was presented at the Tokyo Game Show in 2008 by Kaji and the team. However, this experiment ended in disaster, as most players struggled to grasp the essence of a Souls game. They found the combat to be unwieldy, and the control scheme felt cumbersome. From this experience, Miyazaki learned that the intricacies and appeal of Souls games couldn't be fully appreciated in a brief five-minute demo. Reflecting on this, Miyazaki remarked, while we might consider holding some kind of preview event, we don't have plans for releasing a demo for Dark Souls. Dark Souls, by its very nature, isn't the kind of game that can effectively showcase its charm in a short play session. It's not about attempting to make the demo engaging solely because the full game is captivating. Additionally, creating demos isn't something I excel at. 
Dark Souls underwent substantial changes during its development, and we are fortunate that most of these modifications were documented in an interview conducted by Famitsu. The interview featured not only Miyazaki, but also several key artists who contributed to the game, including Hiroshi Nakamura, Masanori Waragai, Daisuke Satake, and Mai Hatsuyama. Priscilla stands as one of the game's bosses, yet she exhibits an unusual behavior upon entering her combat zone. Instead of immediately attacking, she kindly requests that you leave the area in peace. Naturally, in the unforgiving world of Dark Souls, players often choose to initiate the battle. But did you know that Priscilla was originally conceived as the game's main heroine? What does the concept of a heroine even entail in a Miyazaki game? Was her role intended to resemble that of the doll in Bloodborne, or the Firekeeper in Dark Souls 3? It's worth noting that Dark Souls is the sole installment in the Souls series, lacking a prominent female guide typically found in the central hub of the game. Daisuke Satake elaborated, Initially, Priscilla was the heroine of the story, and she was going to be there, for example. Miyazaki added, She was indeed the heroine of the story at one point. Originally, Priscilla was planned to reside within the Firelink Shrine. Given the shrine's role as the central hub, this aligns with the notion that she was intended to serve as the female guide for the protagonist, akin to the roles played by the doll and the firekeeper in other games. However, Miyazaki eventually decided to relocate her to the painted world. When asked about this shift, Mai Hatsuyama inquired, You decided to place the former heroine Priscilla here? Miyazaki responded, Indeed. I believe her presence complements the setting well, given her snow-colored appearance. Moreover, the painted world seems like a refuge for those who are pursued. Priscilla aligns with that theme. The Firelink Shrine serves as the central hub of Dark Souls, offering access to various locations depending on the player's chosen path. Additionally, it becomes a gathering place for various NPCs encountered during exploration. Interestingly, the shrine was initially conceived as a water temple. While the final game still features water near the spot where Frampt appears, the small pond depicted in early concept art has since dried up. Miyazaki elaborated on the shrine's development, stating, In the beginning, I envisioned a gathering of people around a bonfire. Consequently, Firelink Shrine was among the first areas we designed. Despite its relatively small size, it connects to multiple locations and hides numerous secrets. It proved to be a truly enjoyable place to conceptualize and create. Daisuke Satake added, That's right. From what I recall, our original design did center around it being a water temple. However, as the game's themes of kindling and fire took shape during development, the presence of water in the shrine gradually diminished. Miyazaki further explained, Indeed, yes. Since Firelink Shrine serves as the game's primary hub, my initial vision was for it to be a soothing place, featuring water, foliage, soft lighting, and subtle music. As Mr. Satake mentioned, while many of these elements remained, the introduction of kindling and the arrival of Frampt later in the game led to the gradual disappearance of water from this area. Additionally, the bonfire's placement originally occupied a different location. Its current position used to be a pond. We opted to relocate it because the original site wasn't flat and impacted the player's sitting animation. As a result, we searched for level ground, leading us to place the bonfire where it is now. If you've watched the Vampire Hunter D anime, you may be familiar with the character known as Left Hand, a face present in the hero's hand. This unique character not only speaks but also serves various purposes, such as absorbing poisons from the hero's body and dispelling curses and enchantments that afflict the hero. Interestingly, Guinevere was originally conceptualized to have something similar in her hand, likely intended for healing purposes. Miyazaki shared insights into his creative process, stating, In truth, my initial idea was to introduce a truly gigantic woman into the game. I recall being inspired by a manga of Fujiko Fujio, where a company president seeks solace from his stressful work life by joining an exclusive club. Within this club, there is a giant woman who cares for its members, almost like a motherly figure. I found this scenario intriguing, a colossal, nurturing, and compassionate woman a presence that many of us long for from our childhood. That's what I aimed to incorporate into the game. Furthermore, I originally intended to include a mouth in the palm of her hand, and we even created all the necessary animations. However, this concept didn't make it into the final version of the game. While adventuring through Lordran, 
you'll encounter the friendly blacksmith known as Andre. However, it's intriguing to note that he once had a significantly more substantial role in the game's narrative. Originally, Andre was conceived as a descendant of Gwyn, a key figure in the Dark Souls lore. In this early concept, towards the conclusion of the hero's journey, Andre was intended to play a crucial role in assisting the player in accessing a hidden door within the Firelink Shrine, which would have been pivotal for the player's progress. During a discussion, Otsuka inquired, We were initially talking about Priscilla. Are there any characters like her whose role changed drastically as the development progressed? Miyazaki responded, Oh indeed, there are many, such as Andre of Astora. We initially envisioned a much more significant role for him in the story. Satake remarked, Now he is no longer related to Gwyn, is he? Miyazaki clarified, Yes, we altered that aspect. He was initially intended to be a descendant of Gwyn, tasked with safeguarding a door within the Firelink Shrine. Then, towards the end of the game, he would have shifted the goddess statue aside to facilitate the player's journey. However, as the game's development progressed, Andre's role evolved into that of a simple blacksmith. The Centipede Demon stands out as one of the game's formidable bosses, particularly during your initial encounter with it. Its battle arena is set amidst a sea of lava, creating a challenging dynamic where you must manage both the menacing creature and your position within the hazardous environment. Interestingly, it was originally planned for the Centipede Demon to be located atop the church near the first bell in the game. However, in the final version, this location was taken over by the gargoyles. Miyazaki shed light on this decision, stating, the gargoyles were originally designed as adversaries that would confront you before you rang the bell in the bell tower. Initially, the centipede demon, now found in Izalith, occupied that space. However, considering the progression path players typically follow through the game's early stages, which takes them to Sen's fortress and Anorlando, this monster didn't seem to fit naturally. Additionally, as the first boss encounter players face, I wanted something more in line with the game's typical challenges. Given the church's spacious, open environment, we settled on the gargoyles as a fitting choice. Smo, along with his partner Ornstein, is often regarded as one of the standout boss battles in the game. However, it's fascinating to note that he was originally intended to be a member of the Four Knights, a status he did not ultimately achieve in the final game. During the game's design phase, the composition of the Four Knights had not yet been finalized. Smo was the first member to be conceptualized, followed by the Channeler. However, both Smo and the Channeler were eventually excluded from this group. Miyazaki elaborated, saying, We began working on Smo during the very early stages of concept development, while Ornstein was introduced later. I recall that the Channeler's design was concurrent with that of Smo, and they were initially referred to as Knights C and D within the context of the Four Knights. The idea was that by establishing these two as members, it would compel us to create Knights A and B. In the end, this plan did not come to fruition, and the concept of the Four Knights was abandoned. Efforts and design work originally meant for Knights A and B were reallocated to other characters, such as Artorius and Ornstein. The Channeler's role underwent a complete transformation, leaving Smo as the sole character from the original Four Knights concept. I really liked Smo's design, so I wanted to do something special, and transformed him into something almost heretical. Among Dark Souls players, the Bed of Chaos is often cited as one of the most disliked bosses, with many fans finding the encounter frustrating. It's intriguing to note that this boss was originally conceived to feature the King of Izalith, who was meant to be situated at the center of the bed, wielding various attacks. An unused model of this boss was later discovered and is depicted in accompanying art. Notably, the Bed of Chaos is a source of regret for Miyazaki regarding Dark Souls. He openly acknowledges that they could have executed it better and reflects on the challenges they faced during development. Miyazaki explained, There were instances during development where I knew something was amiss, but I struggled to articulate what I wanted and provide a solution. This proved challenging for both the artist I was collaborating with and me. The prime example of this is the Bed of Chaos. In response, Otsuka commented, You initially designed the King of Izalith. What was that like? Waragai shared, Originally, he was intended to be the boss of the area. While the Bed of Chaos sprawls on the floor and extends its appendages, the King would be seated on his throne. Miyazaki concurred, saying, Yes, that's correct. 
It gave us quite a bit of trouble. I've previously discussed various aspects of the game that I'm not entirely satisfied with, but personally, my greatest regret is the bed of chaos. Our artists and designers poured their best efforts into it and generated some genuinely remarkable ideas, but it revealed a significant flaw in our production process. It's something I aspire to improve in the future. The Black Knights in Dark Souls serve as a prime example of Miyazaki's principle of hidden beauty. These formidable foes are scattered throughout the game in various locations, and whether or not you encounter them depends on your chosen paths and the extent of your exploration during your journey. Interestingly, they were initially intended to roam freely in the game, similar to a few Black Knights in Dark Souls 3, making them less easily missable. However, there is a plausible theory that their roaming behavior was removed due to their inherent difficulty, especially when encountered in the early stages of the game. Imagine being spotted by one, pursued relentlessly across the map, only to meet your demise in the end, necessitating a return to the last bonfire rested at. My Hatsuyama inquired, Regarding the Black Knights, I recall they were originally intended to wander the world. What led to the decision to change that? Miyazaki explained, We had been contemplating the introduction of wandering enemies since Demon's Souls. Back then, it was implemented with enemies like Skeletons and Grim Reapers, but for some reason, we hadn't yet implemented it in subsequent games. The behavior of the Black Knights was altered, but their fundamental role remained unchanged. Since they were consumed by the flames alongside Gwyn when he linked the flame, they now wander the land. Domnall serves as the character to approach if you wish to purchase exotic armor, weapons, and items obtained from monsters, or NPCs you've defeated in the game. Interestingly, he was initially intended to be the owner of the Avalon, a powerful crossbow. However, Miyazaki made a later decision to change this arrangement. Hiroshi Nakamura brought up the subject saying, Concerning Domnall, didn't we create a weapon for him, the triple crossbow? It's one of my favorites and is quite unique, particularly when compared to other weapons in the game. To this, Miyazaki responded, By triple crossbow, are you referring to the Avalon? Regrettably, I had to relocate it to the Duke's archives. In the original plan for Dark Souls, there was a concept involving an event where the player would be summoned to Ulysil to rescue Dusk. However, Miyazaki chose not to pursue this idea initially, but he revisited it later through the DLC expansion Artorias of the Abyss. Miyazaki explained, During the early stages of development, we had originally intended to implement an event where the hero would be summoned to Dusk's world. Her backstory was linked to Ulasil, and the plan included a quest to rescue her within that kingdom. However, we decided to abandon this concept fairly early on. It simply wasn't feasible at that time. I had a vision of restoring the old forest to its original state, with its ruins and structures. In this vision, the hero would embark on various quests in Ulasil after being summoned by Dusk. Unfortunately, we weren't able to realize this vision. Dusk is one of the characters I hold in high regard, and I had contemplated events and quests related to her. To provide some context for understanding the success of Dark Souls compared to Demon's Souls, Let's compare their first week earnings. In fact, Dark Souls managed to outsell Demon Souls' one-year international sales in just one week in Japan. Miyazaki himself was taken aback by the overwhelming support from fans and the remarkable success of Dark Souls. He expressed his surprise, saying, The success of Dark Souls was truly astonishing to me because I didn't anticipate it at all. It's hard to put into words just how unpredictable and surprising it was for me. I can only describe it as a massive shock. When Dark Souls was announced, we never expected to receive such anticipation and hype from the fans. For example, the day before its release, we had an incredible number of interviews lined up. In contrast, Demon's Souls only had one or two interviews. The response to Dark Souls was simply remarkable. After the release of Dark Souls, it received widespread acclaim and was voted as the best game of the year by various websites and publications. Miyazaki conveyed his heartfelt message to the fans, expressing his gratitude. First and foremost, I want to convey my sincere gratitude to your readers. Our development team, including myself, is deeply thankful for the tremendous support and love that Dark Souls has received from fans all around the world. Lastly, I'd like to express my determination to your readers. 
As long as there's an opportunity to create games, I promise to deliver more interesting and immersive experiences that will continue to be a hot topic among you all. When asked about the possibility of a sequel, Miyazaki's response suggests that he may not be the one directing such a project. He said, I don't know about a sequel, but it seems like we can make a new one. We still need to look at reviews and player feedback before making any decisions. We'll also consider how it's received both domestically and internationally, and assess the market for it. At the moment, I truly can't say anything about a sequel, and even if one were to happen, I can't provide any details right now. Dark Souls is not solely mine, and I believe it might benefit from some fresh perspectives. It's important to understand that if there were to be a sequel, the series would become a brand, and a brand may require new talent and energy. Given all these considerations, I'm uncertain. However, one thing is certain, I want to continue creating things.